Today's scripture reading will be from James 4, 7 through 11. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard. Again, if you would like to follow along, James 4, 7 through 11. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Good morning, everyone. Sun Valley Church of Christ, glad you're with us this morning. Try to say that without smiling. Sun Valley Church of Christ. Can't do it, can you? No, because we are people of joy. It's a day the Lord has made. We are rejoicing. We're glad in it because we are together, united in Christ, worshiping our Father together as a family. Thank you for all you young men getting up here and leading the worship this morning. Great job, Chris, leading songs, and Brian on the uh, scripture reading, and Portland on the Lord's table. It, it's a blessing, blessing to be here today, and I'm thankful that my God has brought us here together. We want to welcome our visitors. Uh, we want you to know you're a visitor for a very short time because once you're here, you become an honored guest. We love having you. We look forward to seeing you again. And I bet you're sitting there going, I wonder when that time is. And I'm going to answer that at 6 o'clock this evening. We get back together again for another portion of God's Word where we can grow and glorify our God in that growth. What a, what a blessing it is. Um, being here is a choice. It's a choice we make because we love God. And we talk about overcoming the world. And folks, if we're not building in this love, if this love in us for God is not growing, we're not going to be able to overcome the world because their, their idea of what power is is getting stronger and stronger. And so we have to be growing in our love, which is God's power in us uh, to overcome what's out there. It's our faith, yes, but that we can't have faith without love and that was a news blast for me that I can't love without choice without choice there cannot be love we have to make the right choice to let that love show we choose God we choose to be here you know and so uh, that that is a way of life that's a law that that's just the way things are you can't change that that's the will of God you know I uh, had a friend who was a cat owner one time, and he said, I knocked over a plant in the kitchen, but my cat saw me, he said. So I had to spray myself with water so I could prove to him that that law applies to everybody. <laughs> what has God got to do to us to make us understand that his laws apply? His laws are his will is what's going to happen. Whether we like it or not, whether we can out-debate somebody or not, whether we can out-argue, it's, it's the point. It's his point. It's his will, and it's going to be done. The world seems to think that God's will or his laws aren't for everyone. But folks, I want to remind you, if we don't recognize the defeat of sin, how are they going to recognize victory? What victory are they waiting for? What victory are they wanting to uh, achieve? Folks, the only way they're going to understand the victory is to see it in us. That's us. That's you and I. We, we get to show the world the difference between what they think and what God knows. The difference between the power of their opinion and the power of God's will. Without these things, the world may never know that there is a defeat, that there is a victory, that yes, judgment day is coming. In fact, I was talking to Jack today and uh, looked at a new statistics that said that, that only 20% of people who call themselves Christians believe in the one true God. That's amazing. 
20% of the people that call themselves Christians don't even believe that God is who he is. Now, you don't think we have a battle going on? The war is against the Lamb. You see? So you and I have to grab hold of our boots, tighten them up, and get on this road, this path, because God sends his truth out in the world through his church. And folks, I'm praying that we believe in that truth. I'm praying that we we're ready to defend that truth, to stand up for what's right, to help our children have a world in which they can worship God. Because the way it's going, that may not be true. So you and I get an opportunity to show our love for God, and we have a way to that victory. We have a way to show the world that God's victory is in us, his victory, his triumph. How do we do that? Well, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, we're going to look at it. We're going to grab some points. How to do this? We're going to learn to love God in His salvation. And ah, tell me, oh, well, I love God in His salvation. I'm not talking about what the world calls love. I want us to love the way that God wants us to love. To love Him and His salvation. To love God and His church. Folks, this is important. We're not just another religious organization sitting here doing good things. We are the Lord's church. We are people that give our lives and our hearts to God. Love Him with all our heart, mind, and soul. Heart, mind, and strength. Every ounce of our being. We gotta love God in His commands. You know? I mean, I, I, I love the book, but do I love it enough to make this who I am? And we gotta love God in His life. You know, there are so many people that believe they can serve God, but still hold on to the old life. And as John points out, and we'll read, we'll see that that's not so when it comes to God's will. And so what we need to do, folks, is break the chain of what false belief is, what false religion truly is. Because when we melt it all down, and it comes down to where the rubber meets the road, right? It's that God's church loves God. And we're going to talk about that through his salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 says, Whoever believes, now see, right there we're going to get lost in the world if we're not careful. Oh, I believe, so I'm there, right? He says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So we want to grab a hold of this. We truly want to understand what all these words mean. And so we're going to have to open up our hearts and our minds and dive in to see what's going on. God made a very good statement for what our goal should be in life in this life that we're living. And our goal is for our love to be like His. Our love is not to be like the world's or what it used to be, but it's growing every day and it's becoming more like His love. And part of that love understands the word believe. It is more than a mental adaption of what, what's going on. A more of a mental embracement. It is a lifestyle. Because believe is a verb form of the same word we get the word faith from. The demons believe, right? James is very clear about it. The demons believe and they shudder. So they have an active faith. Their faith denies God and they shudder. Our active faith believes in God and acts upon his word. Those who believe and are baptized, that's an active faith being baptized. They're the ones that are saved. Jesus said that in Mark chapter 16. So we need to believe in the biblical sense of what the word means to believe. And if we're going to believe, we believe in his promise. Because do you remember back in Isaiah 7, 14, about 800 and maybe 900 years before Christ was born, it was prophesied that this was going to happen? And the beauty of that is, is over in Psalm 65, verse 9, David writing in the Psalms says that God says he is going to visit the earth. Are you hearing that? God came to visit. He promised that. Do we believe in that promise? 
you know, do we believe that he came and visited the earth? I hope we do, because he promised he would. He promised that he would, and he did in Christ Jesus. In fact, it says that he came and caused it to overflow. He poured his blessings upon the earth by coming himself and visiting the earth. Now, visiting the earth doesn't mean like sometimes we go visit, you know, like I go over Owen's house and say, hey, oh, how you doing, Owen? You're doing all right, very good. I'll see you later, bye. That's not a visit. In God's idea of a visit, I'm over at Owen's house saying, what do you need? What can I get for you? How do I make your Christian life better? How do I make your relationship with Christ better? That's a visit. And that's what God did. He visited our need for a Savior and sent Jesus. Powerful statement that he would do such and that. So we got to believe in that promise. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Is a great example of, of God coming and visiting the earth in the form of what we're talking about. John chapter 1, verse 3. We'll get there, right? We'll be in heaven. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, there are some religions that have put one little letter there that caused a total disruption in our faith. At least their faith. It said, the Word was with God and the Word was a God. That definitive article is not there in the Greek. It's an addition. Do not add or take away from my Word. Verse 2 says, He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. God visited the earth right there, dwelt in flesh among men. We believe in that promise. We believe in his plan. When Jesus came, remember in a couple chapters down the road there, there was about midnight or so, there was a man, a religious leader, high authority man, came up to Jesus and asked him a question. What is this born again stuff? Right? And Jesus gave him the plan. If you are not born again, you will not be able to see or understand the kingdom. Aren't you a religious leader? Aren't you a teacher? You should know these things. Well, well, I can't climb back up my mother's womb, can I? And he said, no, no, this is a spiritual birth. Everybody goes through a natural or physical birth. This is a spiritual birth of the water and the spirit. We believe in that plan. I believe that Jesus is from, a, from God. He says he's born from God, born of God. That's a very important because Jesus was not born. He came from God. God gave a piece of himself to come to this earth. And he came with a plan, a plan that says, now we must be born again. Now that's our words and I get it, but it means to be born from above. Man's logic, pa-ching, God's logic, poof. Poof, there it is, right? It's in us now and we're born from above. God has given us that. It's no longer my logic. I am born from above. And to be born from above, I got to die to the flesh or I can't be reborn. So I've got to understand the idea of God's plan. I love God and I love his, his, his salvation. And that came in his visit. That's his promise. It came in his plan. Jesus told us what that plan is, but it's also his power. You remember John 14, 15, he told the disciples, Jesus walking with the disciples. And he says, if you love me, you hearing me less? You're here. I love you, brother. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's God's power. What did John say? This is the love of God that we love him and keep his commandments. There are so many people that say that they love God, yet 20% of them don't even believe there is a God. Excuse me for hollering. It amazes me where man's logic goes when they're not born from above. God's word is powerful, and his church is blessed with that power. And we are a group of people that say we love God. The world needs to see that love in us. James chapter 1, verses 22, put away all that ugliness of the world and be doers of the word and not hearers who delude themselves. A lot of things in this world that I find hard to believe. You know, 
I find it hard to believe that bears made porridge and the temperature was the only thing wrong with it. Right? But I don't find it hard to believe in God. I don't find it hard to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We're his church. We believe that. And that belief has changed our life. And that's important because when we believe that Jesus is of God, the Christ, the promise of, of God to come in, in the flesh, be that Christ is born of God, from God, then we have to believe in his church. So thankful for the souls that God adds to this church. Jerry, I'm thankful for you. Jeff, thankful for you and, and your leadership. Glenn, yeah, I'm thankful for you. I love you, brother. I'm teasing. I, I'm grateful for our leaders. I'm grateful for every soul that's in this room because if you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, God pours your support and he adds you to the book of life. He adds you. You are here because God added you. Believe in that, folks. Believe in that. Believe in that so much that you understand that when people are not added to his body, they are not saved. And when people are added to his body and leave this body, they are in danger. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. No, go run and tell them you are in danger. That house is on fire. Get out. Get back to the house that God built. Because God established his church upon this land. The second part of verse 1. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Do you love God? Yes. Even Jesus said, you believe in God. Believe also in me, John chapter 14. You cannot believe in God and not believe in Jesus. You cannot believe in Jesus and not believe in what? His church. You can't. That's man's logic, see? Whoop. There you go in the ditch. Blind leading the blind. God established his church through Jesus Christ, his son. By this we know, verse 2, we love the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments. How do we know we love God's church? By loving God and observing his commandments. Folks, if we look at the church as a group of people that we can, ah, whenever I want to get there, you know, if I'm not busy, yeah, ain't nothing but a short, long-winded preacher up there talking a lot. I could watch him. Then we aren't showing the world the love. Hear me? Hello. Is this on? We're not showing the world the love that God wants us to have for his church. You know, there's a lot of preachers that preach for money. I preach because I love you. You understand that? I love you. I want to know where you're at, where you're going. I sound like my mom. Are you kidding me? Now, I'm not talking about your personal life. That's your business. But I want to know where you are spiritually. And if you are getting off this path, I want to reel you back in. Huh? I want to make sure you're there. Not because you pay me. Not because I work for it. Because I am a preacher of the Lord's word in his church. We are family. We are here. I pray that if one day I start getting stupid enough that I think I can walk across the 60, you will slap me in the face and say, get out of that highway. On the same side, I hope you love me enough that if you see me wandering away from my spiritual walk, you'll slap me and say, get back over here where you belong. Now, don't everybody come up here and slap me either. I'm not asking for that. What I am saying is that we love God and we observe his commandments. Observing his commandments, we have to understand we were once dead in the world, but God through his commands gave us life. By obeying those commands, we have this life. Observing is doing. A delusion is hearing and not doing. See, we delude ourselves. God's commands, folks, keep us free 
from the evil one. Did you hear me? God's commands keep us free from the evil one. I hear y'all pray. And one of the biggest prayers I hear, every one of you pray, keep us from the evil one. Don't let the evil one. God says, I'm trying. I'm trying. I gave you the command. I showed you my love. Jesus looked over Jerusalem one time and wept. And he said, I'm like a mother hen trying to collect you under my wings. And when you understand what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I'm trying to give you the boundaries of God's love so you can stay protected. But you're like sheep without a shepherd. You go out there and you go do whatever you all want to go do. And you just can't find the safety of God's love out there in that world. We just can't do that. When we say that we love God's commands, we're willing to observe them. And not only knowing it, but doing it. See, when God says, don't put anything before me, and I hear that, but I don't do it, then I'm deluding myself. Oh, I, I can do this. I, no, 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 you can't. Jesus said, if you don't hate your mother and father, then you cannot. He didn't say, well, it would be really hard for you. He didn't say, Joan, if you don't hate your mother and father, then it's going to be kind of hard to be my disciple. He didn't say that, Joan. He said, if you do not hate your mother and father, you cannot be my disciple. They don't go together. Keep in mind, I used that as an example. Now I caused a whole another explanation here. He's, not, he's already told us that we have to honor our mother and father. So he's not talking about the hate that the world knows us hate. But he's saying, if you don't love me more, if you don't love me in a priority system that puts me above them, then you cannot be my disciple. And so you and I have a chance to show the world by doing God's commands. It's showing that we love God. See, loving God is taking his life and making it ours. That's the church. That's what we do as the church. We feast on his word. There was a guy went to dinner out there in California somewhere, and uh he came across this waitress, long blonde hair, kind of looked like a surfer girl, right? She's very athletic. She had a nice tan, golden blonde hair running down. And he was mulling over the menu, and, and he asked her, he said, do you have roast beef on the menu? He said, yeah. And he, and he goes, well, is, that roast beef, is, is roast beef rare? And she goes, well, really, she says, uh, people like have it every day. <laughs> Our love for God say, give me my dinner every day. Let me eat. Let me, I think somebody talked about that today. We hunger and we thirst for God's word every day. Because why? Because we love God. We love his church. That's what John's writing about. In this, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. We love God in his church. We love God in his children. We take care of the commandments. You know, <laughs> Some see the life of the church as we have to go. We see it as, woohoo, we get to go. We get to go be with the Lord. That's what David wrote in the 122nd Psalm. I'm glad I get to go into the house of the Lord. Does that sound like us? <laughs> If someone was to ask us, what is the love of God? What would we say? Hopefully we'd turn over here to verse 3. For this is the love of God. Woohoo! Right there's the answer. What is it? That we keep his commandments. And we think that's cool. Right? We think that's all right. We keep his commandments. But look what he says. Not only do we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We don't only keep the commandments, we enjoy keeping the commandments. It's not a have to church of Christ, folks. In fact, that's an oxymoron. Don't get me crazy because I didn't call nobody a moron. I said they don't go together. We keep his commandments because we love them. To, to observe them means to treasure them, to guard them. You remember what Paul told Timothy? 
Guard through the Holy Spirit what God has entrusted you, the treasure that God has entrusted with you. You know what? Yeah. Do you know what happened, Joyce? God entrusted you with his treasure. Are you guarding it? Are you letting Satan have his way with us and just taking the treasure and throwing it all over the place? Are we guarding it by letting it rule our life? That's why he said through the Holy Spirit. Guard that treasure that's there. Jesus said, wherever your heart is, there your treasure will be. Our heart must be in this great opportunity with God. Now here's the enjoying part. We get to enjoy his commandments. Burdensome. Look, did you see that word? And his commandments are not burdensome. So if you're a have-to person, you done missed the point. We're get to. Because when those commandments become burdensome, look what happens. Our worship. It becomes an obligation, not an opportunity. Oh, I have to go to church today. Get up, kids. We've got to go to church. You know, I, I know. When I first became a Christian, that's what I was doing. And I grew and I said, wait, 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 that, that can't be right. They, they come on. Let's get up. We get to go to the house of the Lord today. We get to go worship God and be with our family. Woohoo! See, if they're burdensome, then our worship becomes an obligation. The word itself. Oh, Bible study. Uh, I can get there by 10, but I ain't going in at 9. I'm too busy. I've been up all night. It's, it's too much. We get there, folks. When it becomes what? Burdensome. Now, what about the work? Uh, someone else can go knock doors. Uh, someone else can go to the gospel. I mean, I'll watch it on TV. I'm too busy. Oh, so now uh, the word has become burdensome. You see, folks, and I'm not being up here judging anybody. I'm encouraging them not to be that way. We, that shouldn't be us. We love God. We love his commandments. And when we love his commandments, it's a woohoo church, not a woohoo church. Let me show you the difference. Look at Revelation. Psalm 122, we talked about it. I get to go to the house. I'm glad I get to go to the house of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, <laughs> today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be sorrowful in it. No, be glad in it. We are the glad get to church. But look at this one. Revelation chapter 3. Look at verses 16 and 17. Jesus, written by John, talking to the congregation in Laodicea. Look what he said. So because you are lukewarm, lukewarmness comes from a burdensome congregation. You hearing me? Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Look what he says. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and naked and blind. Burdensome churches lose focus. And a lot of things happen. It becomes convenient Christianity. Are you hearing me? Convenient Christianity. Well, if I ain't got nothing else to do today, I guess I'll go to services. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, preacher, I won't be there Sunday. Uh, yeah, I'm taking my dog on the, on the uh, I did a rod, so I'll be gone for a while. What? Wait a minute. Now it's become burdensome. You know, when the church becomes burdensome, we spend a lot, to, uh, a lot more time making a living instead of making a life. Because it becomes burdensome. When it's burdensome, we, we stay more connected to the world than we do God's holiness. Living the holy life that God wants us. When it becomes burdensome, we're accepting the ways of the world more than we are accepting God's ways. Why? Because it's burdensome. I can go to the Diamondback game today and I don't have to say the amen. I don't have to greet people. I don't have to listen to the preacher. Because it's burdensome. But when we love God's church the way that God wants us to, when we love God the way he wants us to love him, then 
his church and his commands are not burdensome, folks. I'm glad you're here because you get to be here. But we are flesh, and I get it. We always look for, it seems like my mom used to say, it's always easy to talk negative. It's hard to talk positive all the time. Do the hard things, my mom would say. Stay positive. There was a sergeant in the military, it's quoted in uh, a book I was reading the other day, it says, and they asked him, they said, I think his name was Sergeant Johnson. He was in the United States Army. People ask how I stay so positive after losing my legs. And he says, I simply ask how they stay so negative when they have both of theirs. It's a good quote. Good point. You know, God has given us something to be positive about. We're serving a positive God. Let's be positive about his commands that he gives us. Let's love those commands. Let's take those commands and let them guide our life. And let's smile while we're doing it. Now, see, y'all been tested because you have me as a preacher, so that's going to make it harder. But that's okay. We can do it. Because why? We're going to learn at this. At the end of this, we can overcome the world through our faith. Because that's the life that he gives us. Look what he says in verse 4. In 1 John chapter 5, he says in verse 4, For whatever is born of God, we've already covered that. We know what born of God is. It's more than just being born. It's, it's created with this kind of life, this kind of spirit, this kind of nature. Overcomes the world. Folks, that word overcome. And that is in present active. That means it's always going to overcome the world. Conquer. You remember the, the kind of shoes? I looked around to see if I see any of them stripes on there. The Nike shoe has this word, Nike. It's the word, it means to conquer. We conquer the world. We overcome the world by not talking like they talk. Not, not using the words that they use. Not even coming close to those words because we speak, like Peter said, as the oracles of God. Our words are different than theirs, their desires. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 12, we're reminded of the ugliness of the world and their words, the way that they talk, the way that they um, reason with their words. So, Titus chapter 2 verse 12 says, instructing us to, de deny un to deny ungodliness, to live sensibly, and righteously and godly in the present age. We don't have their desires. We desire to please God. We overcome their minds because you remember what Jude said about their minds and the kind of minds that they have. Jude chapter one, that's the only chapter there. Verse 19, these are the ones who cause divisions. What? The worldly minded, devoid, having no take or partake in the spirit, devoid of the spirit. Ooh, that ain't me. So I want to overcome the world by overcoming the way my mind works and not letting myself become worldly minded. Christians, hear me. We can and we will overcome the world if we love God and his salvation if we love God in his church, if we love God in his command, and we love God and his life. Noah, I'm very appreciative of you today. You have a friend with you today, and what you are doing is more than taking her to church. You're showing her the love of God in you, that you love his church, you love his life. And if she don't love that life, she may not want to get, uh, I might be, my deal breaker here <laughs> but she may not want to hang around you too much because this is your life this is who we are i want to encourage your friend i haven't met her yet i look forward to that today before we get out of here but i want to encourage everybody here if you're here and you've not allowed god to have your life i pray that you'll ask god to wash away your sin that you'll ask god to clothe you with christ that you'll be baptized this morning.
for those reasons. So God can add you to his book of life. And if you're here this morning, you've done that. Boy, I hope you don't forget about this love. See, we don't really, 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 really like God. We love him. The difference is sacrifice. I want to put God first in my life. Satan doesn't want that. If there's something in your life that Satan's trying to use to put God in another place, let's fight back. No. Let's give it to God and win. This morning, if we can help you as bleeding water, waters of baptism or saying a prayer with you and strengthen your foothold in the mighty body of Christ, let us be there for you today. Take this opportunity right now. Come forward as we stand and we sing.